Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to this Open Access Week event. I'm Molly Van Howling. I'm a professor of law and uh, here at Berkeley Law, where I teach intellectual property and do research in particular on copyright, which I'm going to say a few words about by way of introduction to our main event, Rich Schneider, who's joining us from UCSF. Um, so my experience with copyright includes uh, service as a staff member and then board member of Creative Commons, which is a nonprofit that some of you may have heard of that puts out legal tools that facilitate sharing of copyrighted works. And um, we decided not to go with this slogan, saving the world from failed sharing, but I've always really kind of liked it. And the reason is that many academic authors in particular are enthusiastic in theory about sharing their work with others. The more sharing, the better. The more attention we get, the more readers, the better. But it turns out that it's more complicated to share than it should be. And in fact, we need sometimes some institutional help to prevent us from messing up our own attempts at sharing. And what really makes it complicated is, alas, copyright law. So copyright law seems simple enough for us academic authors. It gives us automatic rights as soon as we create a work of authorship that's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And your computer file, your cocktail napkin, your before class notes, those are all tangible mediums of expression that count for capturing your copyrighted works. And as the author, we are the initial owners of these copyrighted works. And the UC policy on copyright reaffirms that idea, does not, for example, claim to own our works by virtue of the so-called work for hire doctrine, under which some employers do take ownership of works of their employees. But UC has a policy which provides copyright ownership to faculty for their scholarly work. So, so far, so good. We have copyright. We can use that copyright to uh, restrain copying of our works, but we can also use it to facilitate sharing. However, the ownership of a copyright may be transferred. And many of us have had the experience of transferring our copyrights from ourselves to publishers, for example. What that means is that the publisher becomes the copyright owner. And these are the rights that copyright gives to copyright owners, the right to, to share, basically, or not share, to control the reproduction, the distribution, and even the preparation of revised versions, derivative works based on the original work. Now, the catch is that these are exclusive rights of the copyright owner. So if we have transferred our rights to someone else, a publisher, they are the exclusive rights holder, and they can exclude everyone including us. We as authors might no longer be copyright owners with control over how our work is shared or not shared. And that's a dilemma for sharing that institutions can help us to solve. So Creative Commons is one of those institutions, but we can also look to the University of California to be one of those uh, institutions. And one possible mechanism for that is a policy that gives not copyright ownership to the University of California, but rather non-exclusive rights that the university could use to facilitate open access and sharing of our works for the public's benefit through mechanisms like e-scholarship, for example. This uh, has been proposed as part of a faculty-driven initiative. And uh, I, as a former member of the UC uh, Faculty Senate Library Committee, and I think we have some current members uh, of that committee here now, have participated in an effort to draft such a policy uh, that has been put on the table system-wide by UCOLASC, the uh, university, the uh, UC system-wide library and scholarly communications uh, committee. And uh, last year's library committee here at Berkeley, for some of the reasons I've suggested, uh, expressed its enthusiasm uh, in principle, although with some suggestions for the details for such a policy, explaining in our feedback to UCOLASC that such policies make it easier for academic institutions to disseminate specified scholarly output to the public in a way that is consistent with the preferences of faculty authors, but does not require the institutions to seek permission for each instance of dissemination. Basically, facilitating sharing by cutting down on transaction costs, by giving 
non-exclusive rights to an institution in a way that does not interfere with our continued retention uh, of those rights, or frankly, if we insist on transferring those rights to a publisher, the current draft allows a waiver of the, uh, of the policy that would make that possible as well. This is the site where we can get access to the draft policy, which is also on the table. As you walked in, um, I imagine we'll have lots of questions about how such a policy might be implemented, and that's why today is a perfect opportunity. Rich Snyder is joining us from UCSF. He has been chair of the library committee at UCSF and also of the system-wide committee and has been active in that capacity uh, in years of efforts to gather faculty momentum on open access policies um, with success this year with the unanimous faculty adoption of an open access policy at UCSF, which is almost identical to the policy that's now uh, on the table from UCOLASC. And so Rich is here uh, to tell us about how scholarly communication is being reshaped uh, at UCSF and potentially system-wide through this policy. He is a professor in the orthopedic surgery department at UCSF. And uh, I think he's uh, ready to join us with um, lots of details and then lots of time, I think, for Q&A and discussion. OK, mouth 10 inches from Mike is what I'm being instructed here. So uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming and uh, listening to this presentation. This is a a presentation that I've been giving over the past year uh, at almost every academic senate committee at UCSF and other institutions that have asked me to do so. And really, um, the goal of this presentation is to bring everybody up to speed as to why uh, an institution would want an open access policy, really what is an open access policy, what are the benefits for the faculty and for the institution and for society as a whole. And then to tell you a little bit about why UCSF took on this initiative and what our experience has been uh, since we passed the policy in May. And hopefully this will be uh, a way that uh, individual campuses can move forward uh, with their own policies or in the adoption of the policy that's been put forward system wide. Uh, so this presentation is about 20, 25 minutes, but um, if you feel like you want to interrupt at any time, ask questions, further clarification, I'm happy to do that. We can make this more of an interactive discussion. Okay, so really uh, the big question, why a faculty open access policy? Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through some of the costs of the current closed system of scholarly publishing. These are the actual costs, the societal costs. And in our case at UCSF, we're, we're basically a biomedical campus, so we're focused primarily on the scientific costs, uh, but this could be uh, applied to any specific discipline. Um, I'm going to talk about open access as an alignment of our academic principles, our intellectual rights, and our academic mission. Uh, and then I will talk about the open access policy that we passed at UCSF, which, as Molly said, is, is almost identical to the policy that is being proposed at the other uh, nine campuses, and this was by design. Uh, UCSF, uh, we decided we would kind of be the canary in the coal mine for the system and see if we could pass this policy and work on some of the challenges around uh, the commercial publishers and how they would be responding to the policy, and then uh, working around issues of implementation and ultimately compliance. And then there are some frequently asked questions at the end that we can talk about or we can just ask our own questions, even if they're infrequent. Okay, so the major motivation for the policy really comes out of what I think many of us would see as an absurd life cycle for the scholarly article. Uh, you know, a scholarly article really starts around there at number one where um, there are readers for these articles that are out there. Um, and based on the literature, you think of new research questions, you use the literature, you apply for a grant, uh, it takes a lot of energy to write the grant, uh, then you perform the experiments, uh, you're paying payroll and, and, and cost of reagents and all of the other things that go into uh, producing the product. Um, then you take that product, you write up the results, you put it into a manuscript, and you give that product away for free to a commercial publisher. You say, I'd like to publish this work, and you hand this thing over. Um, in most cases, it's to a commercial publisher. And then those commercial publishers take that work, and they have variable costs. They prepare these articles for publication in, in scholarly journals. Uh, at number three here, this includes the review, the peer review process, which is done by all of us as, as 
as colleagues or as um, experts in particular fields. And then uh, we would edit those articles as editors of those journals or sitting on the advisory board of those journals. Uh, and then we would accept or reject those articles for publication. So really, the publisher is a conduit through which the activities of the authors who are faculty and the peer reviewers and editors who are faculty are doing all of their work for free. Uh, and then the publishers take that work and they add some value to it. They put an imprint on it that somehow stratifies that work into prestigious or not so prestigious or highly specialized work, depending on the journal that it's published in. Uh, they provide some bibliographic services. They get those works indexed, so they show up in databases and search engines. Um, and then they turn around and they sell the access to that work to our, um, our libraries. And they do that at the tune of, in our case, as a system of somewhere around $40 million a year that we spend for uh, licensing content, electronic content, uh, for the work that we and, and many other academics create. Um, if you look at the percent increase in cost, and this is, again, biased towards the health sciences because that's where I'm coming from, uh, we can see that over the past 10 years or so, the, the costs that the publishers have been charging for these journals have gone up on average at 114% relative to the consumer price index, which is around 31%. So clearly the costs must be related to something, right? There must be some value that the publishers are adding to the process that they could justify their charges um, or that perhaps um, you know, there's some other reasons why we see these tremendous increases in costs. And, and I guess uh, framing this in the context of what we're all going through in the UC system, um, it began to raise some eyebrows, at least in our um, world, as to why these journals were costing more and more money every year uh, when we at UC were on furloughs and we were cutting programs and we were sl slashing our budgets and watching journal, subscription, uh, get, journal subscriptions get cut year after year. So uh, it turns out that not only are the costs going up, but library budgets are going down. And of course, most of you in the library world know this very well. Um, so these are the library expenditures as a percentage of total university expenditures for about 40 US institutions reporting since 1982. And so again, you can see that universities are making decisions about where they're going to put their money, and those decisions are directly affecting libraries quite negatively. If you look at the money that libraries actually have to spend on materials and support all of the scholarly activities of faculty and students, uh, we can see that the greatest expenditures fall under the category of serials. Uh, those expenditures are up 379%, um, exceeding library budgets tremendously uh, versus the total expenditures and other, other expensive things like salaries and, and operating costs. And, and the money that has to be spent on access to these journals comes at the expense of things like monographs and books and other things that make libraries great that librarians have to make decisions about which disciplines they're going to support and how these resources, these scarce resources, are going to be allocated. So as I said, if we look at how we spend our money system-wide in terms of access to electronic digital content, uh, we spend around $38 million. Um, about 16% of that comes from the California Digital Library. About 84% comes back from the 10 campuses. And at UCSF, uh, we, we contribute about 4% of that total. And I'm sure Berkeley uh, contributes quite a bit to that as well. So despite the money that we're spending, uh, we keep losing access to content. There's more and more content out there that faculty want access to, but because of the budget situation and the rising costs, since 2008, we've had to cancel nine database contracts since 2008. Uh, 600 journals have can been canceled uh, in 2010 and 11, uh, including one entire contract with a major publisher. And we've got many more journal con cancellations slated for 2013. So we're running out of money. There's more expensive journals out there. And we're trying to figure out a way to make this whole thing work so that we can get access to the content that we want. But if we stop for a second and we ask, well, how are the commercial publishers doing in all of this? We know how we're doing in this situation, but you know, what does it look like from their side of the relationship? Because clearly the publication process, as I showed in that first slide in the life cycle of a scholarly article, is really supposed to be a mutually beneficial relationship where we get something out of it and the, and the publishers get something out of it because we're providing content and they're providing a service. So based on the services that they provide, 
Um, if we look at the top four publishers, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, and, Form and Informa, they made about $6 billion last year, or between 2010 and 2011, on their commercial pro um, publishing enterprises. So many of these are part of large corporations and large companies, but they, their, their publishing divisions, in case of Elsevier, had a 36% profit margin, Wiley a 42% profit margin, and so on and so forth. And you can compare this to other companies that we can probably pretty clearly see the value of what they add to the process of their business. And like Apple and Google, they have profit margins that are 24 and 27%. So how can we explain, and I would ask the commercial publishers, how can they justify, in the context of this partnership, profit margins and profits that are so out of whack with the reality of what academics are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of their own financial situation. In addition to the actual money for licensing, we can look at what faculty authors add to the process um, and what they do for free. Um, so we, not, we don't just create the content for free and give it to them, but we also, like I said, provide the peer review, the editorship, the advisory board service, and if you take the amount of work that we contribute, say, uh, as, as an author to Elsevier journals. Uh, we, con we contribute about 2.2% of all of the content to Elsevier. Um, and if you just kind of ex uh, you know, use those numbers and try and estimate how much revenue based on Elsevier's profit statements, that's about $31 million to their bottom line, uh, or $31 million in profits, about $9.8 million to their bottom line. And you can do the same thing for the Nature Publishing Group. UC authors contribute about 12% of all the content in Nature alone. Um, and the, the, the contribution to their revenue is about $5 million, about $700,000 uh, to their bottom line. So we've added a tremendous amount of value just on the content side. And then on the peer review side, um, if you take the report from the uh, Scientific and Technical and Medical um, Association the report in 2009 says that the typical reviewer spends five hours per, per review in about eight articles a year. And if you take that and you um, assign that to uh, FTE, values for you know, a mid-career faculty member doing the work, it's about $21 million in value that we're adding to the peer review process. Now, put that on top of the $40 million that we're already spending to buy access to the content and ask, you know, how much money are we really adding to the system for the commercial publishers? So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is really to, to think about ways to change the economics of commercial publishing, the economics of how it is we get our information out there. So. Um, you know, m many of the arguments that you'll hear about open access are really framed around the idea of, of getting faculty work out there and more, more highly visible and, and getting your citation indices to be higher for promotion and, and career advancement and so on. But I would argue that one of the real values of open access and changing the current system is as equally as important as this economic argument for the reasons that I just outlined, and I'll come back and, and tell you a little bit what a world could look like if we got a better handle on the economics. So uh, open access, I'm assuming that most of you have a good idea of what open access is, but really as a movement, historically, um, it kind of all started around 2002. There's this uh, Budapest meeting that defined open access as the worldwide electronic distribution of the peer-reviewed journal literature, completely free and unrestricted access to it by scientists, scholars, teachers, students, and other curious minds. And then a year later, uh, there was a meeting in Bethesda, which helped spur the NIH and others to start thinking about ways of supporting open access and really defined open access publishing uh, as meeting two conditions, and we'll come back to that at the end when we talk about the policy, because really the policy addresses both of these. The first is that the authors grant a license to some entity, perhaps their institution or some other body, to uh, make that work publicly available. And the second component is that there's a deposit requirement that allows authors or that institution to make that work immediately available. So the benefits of open access for faculty and society are are, there are many. Um, you know, as you've probably heard, open access just by definition increases the, the visibility, usage, and impact of research. There are many studies that show that when someone sits down at, say, uh, um, in the case of the sciences at PubMed, and you're searching for keywords and you're trying to find relevant literature, the first article that you go to is not the one that's the most recent or the one that's most relevant, really the one that you have, the first, the first one that you have access to. Uh, and so those kinds of behaviors would be changed in a situation where people could actually get access to all of the content. 
Uh, open access fuels innovation, discovery, progress. It allows faculty to retain controls over their publications. So as Molly indicated, when you sign a copyright transfer agreement, you lose the rights to the derivatives of your work. So if, you want, if you're asked to write a book chapter and you want to include a graph that you've generated or, or uh, some kind of diagram that you might have made that's now been transferred to Elsevier, you have to ask Elsevier and sometimes pay $500 to get access to reprint the work that you created. And in many cases, Elsevier will ask, well, who's publishing it? And if it's Wiley, you can forget about it. They might not grant you access. Um, so that's another major aspect of this, is that you now have control over the derivatives of your own work. Just, just a point sure. Of I would say that you have the right to use your own work, but not in the Bethesda and Budapest. Sure. Right? You don't actually retain the right to control it, because you're giving everybody the right to use it. Right. You That's correct. Uh, so more broadly, we would say that open access promotes knowledge and free expression as a pu I was like seven inches, I think. <laughs> Too close. Too close, OK. Uh, promotes knowledge and free expression as a public good. It supports our mission of teaching and learning as a public institution. Um, you know, I think this is an important uh, reason for supporting open access at the system-wide level, because the public should have access to the work that we create. We hope they will be supportive of us through taxpayer dollars um, over the long term, although we know that's kind of up for debate right now. But uh, maybe part of the reason why the public is uh, not as supportive of UC as a, as a public institution is because they don't really know what we do. They can't get access to the work that we create. They don't have a good sense of the content uh, that is supported by their taxpayer dollars. And so open access would allow them to get access to that work. Um, and as I'll mention it, I think open access, the argument can be made, often offers potential savings for libraries and institutions as a whole. And importantly, as an economic piece, this um, new model can create free market forces and competition for publishers where currently there is no competition whatsoever um, in the negotiation of licensing and other um, access points for, for closed content. So what are the strategies to achieve open access? Well, there are funder mandates for open access repositories, like the ones that the NIH um, has been pushing, uh, or in Europe, uh, Burroughs Welcome and others. There are institutions. Excuse me. What is funder? A funder mandate means that if someone is paying to support the work, they can make as part of the agreement to accept the research money that you will make that work freely available. And so NIH has this through PubMed Central, that any NIH recipient has to make that work freely available and deposit in the repository. And you see that happening. CIRM, which is a California Institute for Generation Medicine, they're doing that with their work. And many other funders are requiring that that work that comes out of the grants be freely available. Uh, we have institutional mandates, which the policy at UCSF and the one that's being proposed system-wide and here at Berkeley is an example of an institutional mandate. There are more than 140 of these worldwide. Um, there are society-sponsored open access journals. Uh, there are fee-based open access journals and fee-based open access articles within traditional closed journals. So I just want to give you uh, an example of one of these institutional repositories, PubMed Central, and how the content is being used. Uh, so currently, uh, if you get data from PubMed Central, we see that about 40% of the users are the, are the general public, 25% of the users are universities, and about 16% of the users are industry. Um, and, we, you know, the university number might be particularly low because most universities are paying licensing fees. They're paying, they're getting subscription access, and they're not generally accessing content through PubMed Central. At UCSF, uh, we publish about 4,500 articles a year. Uh, about 3,500 of those go into, um, into PubMed Central. And of those uh, 3,500, 50% um, are public access, and uh, about 50% of those are not public access. So the goal of this policy really is to get that other 50% available to the public to complement the PubMed Central. So NIH funding is a major driver of the research engine at UCSF. Uh, since 2012, there are, as I said, more than 140 institutional mandates worldwide. Harvard passed one in 2008, and Stanford, MIT, Kansas, Duke, Emory, Princeton, and UCSF in 2012. Uh, some of you may remember that UCS, UC, the UC system made its first attempt at a system-wide policy in 2006. Uh, this was a policy that really came out of 
the office of the president and the um, and, and many in the library community. Um, and I think the goals of the policy were very lofty and valuable, but I think when it hit the faculty at the academic senate level, there was a lot of resistance. Number one, because faculty didn't really know what was going on, but number two, because faculty didn't feel like um, they wanted to be told where they should publish or how they should publish, or um, and they certainly didn't want this coming from the office of the president. And the other aspect of this policy that we can talk about a little bit later is that the, the policy in 2006 really combined two components. One was the policy itself, and the other was implementation. It was a policy about this thick, and everybody got really hung up on implementation. And it sank the policy. It went out for system-wide review, and the campuses really just, just tore the policy apart, and it went nowhere. Uh, but then if you talk to the folks at Harvard, what they'll tell you is that UCSF's failure was their success. They looked at our policy, they analyzed the whole process, they realized what we had done wrong, and they, they borrowed a lot from our experience, and they were able to successfully pass a policy um, in 2008 and has done a really great job of, of creating a model policy that institutions can adopt. And that's really one of the things that we did, was we looked at, at all these different policies and tried to shape one that would work best for the UC system, uh, taking into account as many different disciplinary concerns as possible. So you'll hear a lot of concerns and myths about open access, that there, there are effects on academic and professional societies, um, that open access uh, really has a, uh, a subpar peer review process, um, that it's a form of vanity publishing because generally you pay to publish, um, and that it's not sustainable over the long run. And, and so you'll hear these, these criticisms coming from a variety of sources. Uh, you know, ask yourself who is doing the peer reviewing for open access journals versus traditional closed journals, it's us. And whether you know, I make a decision about the quality of work depending on whether it's in an open access or closed journal, that's, that's preposterous, and I would imagine that many of you uh, don't pay attention to where the article is being published as much as what the quality of the work is that you're asked to review. Um, as it pertains to vanity publishing, uh, you know, we have no problem paying for a poster uh, to stand in front of at a professional meeting. Uh, in the old days, we would all buy reprints, pay two or three thousand dollars for a stack of reprints. I don't know what's more vain than having a stack of reprints in a drawer that you never use uh, versus paying to actually have something published. Um, we also have no problem paying for other aspects of our research. Uh, if you're in a mouse genetics lab, you can have somebody out there, you pay a third party to make a mouse, a mutant mouse for you, or you order reagents from a catalog. Uh, so there are many parts of our research experience where we're paying for things. And what we're arguing here is that, at least in terms of open access, that open access is just a continu continuation of that. You're paying a third party to publish the work on your behalf. And we can talk a little bit about that uh, in a bit. But there's some really interesting uh, theoretical data around what it would take to support open access worldwide. Uh, and if you look at the total amount of revenue that scientific and technical and medical journals generate from a library subscriptions, um, it's around $9 billion a year. Okay, and then if we look at the amount of scholarly peer reviewed journal articles that are produced every year worldwide, and we see that that's about 1.5 million dollars, or 1.5 million scholarly peer reviewed articles, and then you take a open access fee, an average one for either Biomed Central or some of the PLOS journals, and you multiply that by the 1.5, you get a number of about two and a half billion dollars to support all of the all of the publications that are currently being generated uh, by switching instantaneously from a subscription model to an open access model. And of course, those of you who um, saw how much the publishers made will realize that the difference between what it actually costs and what the publishers made is all of their profits, the $6 billion in profits that they're extracting out of the system. Okay. And so again, while we're not really saying that there is um, not a place for the commercial publishers, that they, that they add value, that the society publishers add value. We're saying, you know, we agree that they do. The big question is, is it that much value? Is it to the value, value of the tune of $6 billion a year when we are all facing our own internal struggles and we are continuing to make choices all the time as, um, as faculty and, and working with the libraries about what, what journals we want access to? So uh, as we spoke a little bit about with Molly, you know, what are the benefits of open access? Well, the UC open access policy would encourage scholarly publishers to change their expectations about who should retain which rights in a publication. My primary motivation for getting involved in this policy was really to change the conversation with commercial publishers. Um, I don't know if 
if many of you remember, but several years ago, uh, the Nature Publishing Group, uh, they proposed a 400% increase in our licensing agreement. So we went from around, or 300%, okay, 300%. They, we were currently, can I say how much we were paying and how much we proposed? It's all out there now, right? This is going on the YouTubes. <laughs> so anyway, um, they, uh, we were paying somewhere around $300,000 a year, and they proposed an increase of about $1.4 in a single year for access to their content. And we said, you know what? We can't do this. We can't afford it, and we don't think it's right. And so we used a technique that had been tried in the past with Elsevier and the cell journals, the cell press journals, which was to threaten them that UC faculty wouldn't publish in any nature publishing group journals, that we wouldn't peer review for them, that we would resign from editorial boards, that we would stop advertising in their journals if they didn't hold our subscription rate to a constant. And we also challenged them to sit down with us and discuss new ways of moving forward in publishing so that we could change the nature of the relationship. And I would say that over the two years that we've been in conversations with the Nature Publishing Group, what we've really developed is a working relationship with them where we can actually envision a future of uh, faculty and publishers working together as a collaboration in a way that's sustainable and mutually beneficial for both, both entities. But if you look at Elsevier, we could never have this conversation with Elsevier before this, before this policy. Um, you know, Elsevier has some of the most restrictive copyright transfer agreements, and they have some of the most challenging negotiating tactics uh, when it's time for renewing our licensing agreements. And so we really had no leverage with them. But subsequent to the passing of this policy, this summer we sat down at UCSF with five or six Elsevier executives across the table and actually had a conversation with them about moving forward in a way that we never would have been able to do had we not been, uh, come together as a faculty and move this policy forward. So again, it's about, for me, it's about changing the expectations with the publishers. It's the publishers now recognizing that faculty care about these publications, whereas before they just assumed faculty were a bunch of monkeys that would just sign their copyright transfer agreements and not pay attention to what happened to their rights. And now we're actually engaged in a conversation where we're saying, no, we do care about our rights and we do care about the economics of the situation and we do want our work out there and we don't like the, the, the way that you're partnering with us or behaving in this, in this partnership. So um, as Molly indicated, the current UC policy actually ensures that we all maintain copyright when once we create a work, we have the copyright. And that's different than other places like University of Michigan where faculty are work for hire and that work is, is uh, the copyrights held by, um, by the University of Michigan. So you know, when we started doing this, um, the, in the original 2006 policy, uh, we were I believe transferring copyright to the regents and faculty were very resistant to the idea of transferring copyright to the regents. It sounded scary, yet faculty were routinely giving up their copyrights completely to the commercial publishers who were managing these rights for profit. Uh, but again, the point of the policy is really that we would be granting a specific non-exclusive right to our university and ourselves inherently in that uh, to disseminate our work rather than granting the publishers exclusive control over the publication. So here's the policy, and it's essentially identical to the policy that you've been uh, handed. And I, uh, so I'm not going to go through it, but again, the most important points here is that the policy um, is a non-exclusive license, and it is a policy that if a faculty member feels like um, it's incompatible with the way that they want to uh, present their scholarly work, it's, it's easy for them to get out of it. Um, one of the major criticisms of this policy is that uh, we've heard that it doesn't go far enough, that it doesn't have teeth, that the waiver that we have built into this policy is too easy for faculty to get out of. Um, in other institutions like Harvard and, and Duke and others, for a faculty member to get a waiver, you have to request a waiver from the provost or some office, and then that waiver has to be granted. In some cases, you have to justify why you want that waiver. Uh, what we have in this policy, because we believe this is firmly a faculty policy from the faculty through the Academic Senate, that if a faculty member wants a waiver, all he or she has to do is say, I want a waiver of this policy, and we've completely automated that process, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. Um, but even though we've built in a system to waive the license, what we're not willing to do in this policy, I believe, is waive the deposit requirement for a variety of reasons, and we can talk about that. 
Um, and the reason, to me, the most important is that it keeps publishers on notice that we are still on some level, even though it will remain a dark copy, maintaining control over our work. Uh, we can collect in, uh, data about that work as an institution that we think would be valuable to the enterprise as a whole. Uh, and so the deposit requirement, we believe, should not be waived, whereas other institutions allow faculty to waive the whole policy itself. Um, another important part of the policy is that um, this policy, really the implementation of this policy uh, and any changes to the policy and the review of the policy is really driven by the faculty in, in collaboration with the university and, and the Office of the President and the librarians in particular. Um, so that's built into the policy. And the last component that the faculty really calls upon ourselves, we're asking ourselves here, to develop and monitor a service or a mechanism that would render implementation and compliance with the policy as convenient for the faculty as possible. So we are keenly aware of the fact that faculty do not want any administrative, extra administrative burden. And so we want to develop a system of implementation that is as seamless and administratively um, uncomplicated as possible. And what you'll notice, though, is that implementation and compliance are at the bottom of the policy, and there's no real specifics about implementation and compliance. And that's on purpose. That's because the goal is now that we have this policy to figure out what the best way to move forward would be. Um, it's, again, to put the publishers on notice that we're taking this seriously and that we're going to start having discussions as institution, as individual campuses or system-wide, about what the best way to move forward. And we've really given ourselves about three years to do that. Can you As it's written, right? I mean, right. It, it, even as a faculty, technically, if I sign my, give the university a license, and then assign what remains of my my copyright to a university, I actually don't technically have any right to my own work, even the because I give it to the university, but they haven't promised to give it back to me. Well, I mean, sure. I mean, on, on, absolutely, on a technical level, that's correct. Um, you know, we believe that the intention of the policy is really that. The, the granting of this license is really to ourselves as part of this university. Um, clearly, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's in the best interest of the university to protect these rights for the faculty and to act in a way that's in their best interests. So, you know, I don't think that the, um, I mean, yes, there were other ways that we could have moved forward with a, with a different kind of license, uh, particularly, you know, like you say, through the Creative Commons licenses. Um, you know, one of the things that we, that we um, took into consideration was the way that the majority of other institutions have been moving forward and the language that they're using, because we believe that if these policies, if the publishers all decide to get together and challenge these institutional policies, there, there would be great strength in the fact that there was tremendous internal consistency throughout all the policies across the various institutions. And so, um, in particular, like the Harvard policy just went through pretty extensive legal review and was found, um, and it was internal legal review, but it was still found to be, um, you know, to set up some really interesting uh, um, situations that would protect the, the policy itself. Okay. Sorry. I think it was my water bottle rolling back and forth. All right. Rich, can I jump in? Sure. And also for other questions, I will run around with the microphone so that we can all be part of the um, videotaping apparatus. Um, so I just wanted to respond a little bit to the question to point out two things. One is that because the license to the university is non-exclusive, it's not inconsistent with individual faculty members also licensing sure. their work on Creative Commons or any other terms. Um, and then I think it's very valuable for institutions to be able to steward our works and be a one-stop shop for people who want to come and see if they can have permission to do whatever inventive thing they want to do with the work as opposed to relying on the terms that individual faculty members have put forward. So let's say we all license on some Creative Commons uh, terms, but someone wants to know whether they can go beyond the terms of the Creative Commons license. If we're doing it as individual faculty members, that means they have to come to us for individualized 
permission, and that gets me back to failed sharing. I worry that we won't do a good job of making ourselves available for renegotiating those permissions, whereas if the institution has a set of rights that they can make available for downstream reuse of our material, I think that's a kind of stewardship that institutions can right, usefully right. As do. You, as you are undoubtedly aware, that, that, that faith is not, um, that, that faith in the university as a, stu as, a, as a public steward of intellectual property is not manifested well in patents. And that uh, anybody who's had to negotiate with the university, um, UC is good in general in this regard, but several of the other institutions you listed up on that board, again with H's and things like that, have not necessarily been uh, easy to in interact with in intellectual, other intellectual property rules. And, and it seems like it's setting up a situation where the university ultimately is is becomes a, a potential um, you know um, you, you conflict you know, potentially, but I think Molly's point the most important point is that it's non exclusive and in fact you know if an author wants to do the spark addendum they can do that they can do anything that you know because it's the least restrictive that we could possibly be in the language of this policy. No, I, I, just, right. I, I mean again I'm, I'm a big big right. supporter. I just I I just think in, in general that that we should be aiming to be more more aggressive of UC's policy than, sure. than, than other institutions have in, in order to, to try to prevent, you know. You know that's right. And I that's like, why. I don't like to think we're taking our cues from Harvard. And, no, no, but that's why, you know, we're reviewing this. This is why we have the, the mechanism here to review the policy, take faculty input, and if it turns out that we're getting too many waiver requests, if the publishers are pushing back too hard, and we want to make put more teeth in this thing, we can do that as a faculty. We're giving ourselves that room to do that and have this policy evol evolve. I mean, I think my strategy here was to take a very pragmatic approach and see what we can get by, you know, see what we can get past first and then let's keep moving forward. We don't have to, you know, get all of the goals that you've articulated so well here and in other places, of course, that, you know, we, we can do this incrementally. And I do think that there's a value to interoperability that weighs in favor of doing what other institutions are doing, even if were we to come up from scratch with our own handcrafted policy, we might do something slightly different. Okay, uh, are there other questions about either some of the kind of context for the open access policy or the policy itself? Yeah. Um, could somebody explain exactly what this non-exclusive business actually means? I mean, uh, sure. What, what's going, I, I mean, I hear these exclusive, non-exclusive, worldwide, okay. so forth. I've actually dealt with those things before and have no idea what in the world that's all about. Well, like, generally when you, when you, when, yeah, so, and, and when you, when you sign an uh, author agreement, generally what you're doing is you're granting the publisher an exclusive license to publish. That means they're the only ones who are allowed to publish it. And uh, sometimes that's an exclusive license period or an exclusive commercial license. It varies. Um, and... What we're saying is that we've created a situation where there is a pre-existing non-exclusive license, meaning it's non-exclusive that we've granted to our institution, but someone else can go ahead and publish because it's non-exclusive. So it gives someone else the right to do something with that work because it's non-exclusive. And most importantly, it means that we still have the right to do whatever else we want to do with the work, which isn't the case if you grant a publisher or anyone else, an exclusive license, then they have the right to exclude everyone else and us, which is what I see as the problematic thing about granting an exclusive license. Right, and then license. the other thing that happens in some good publishers is that they will take your, they'll take your copyright transfer agreement and then they'll grant back some rights. So PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, they will grant back almost all of the rights that, that we want in our policy, yet they won't actually, they're asking us to sign waivers because they've, requested an exclusive right to publish, and they see this deposit as publishing. So, um, you know, there's still some nuances in, in the way that this policy is being, um, is being um, the, the way the policy was developed and the way that it's being viewed by the publishers that still need to be worked out. And there are other examples of publishers that grant back rights. Um, I'm, a, I'm a journal editor, so I'm an associate professor in history, and I'm a journal editor for a non-Elsevier uh, non Wiley journal. It has a $40 individual subscription mm -hmm. and a $100 institutional membership. And I'm wondering what your thinking is for journals that are not Elsevier, how they are going to survive a, a model change. And I ask that in particular because 
most of the subscribers, well, some of the subscribers, but also the authors and indeed the editors and editorial staff are international. So they sub submit from Russia, from Italy, from Germany, from Great Britain. And if we're talking about a model where ideally we transfer um, costs to authors, mm -hmm. how do we, what is your thinking about how international journals recoup um, money f from international authors who might not have access to you know, generous grant su uh, structures like we do in, in the United States? So what, what, what is a model of survival for a small journal like mine that runs on a shoestring and doesn't have you know, the backing of an Elsevier to, to, to see us through? Right, uh, that's a great question, and it's a complicated question. The math um, doesn't always work for some of the small journals, small societies that rely on revenue. Um, we know that a lot of societies, um, small societies, have kind of moved to the dark side, and they get a big check every year to have one of the big publishers publish their journals. Um, we know those big checks don't come from anywhere else other than our libraries. And so, um, you know, they found a solution that works, but it works for them, but it's really part of the problem for us. But then for really small societies that have these operations, as you say, that um, rely on subscriptions, well, it's possible that a subscription model might be the most appropriate for those kinds of journals. It's not like you guys are out there making $6 billion a year in profits. You're probably just making enough money to support the journal and perhaps have an annual meeting or something like that. But it's, you know, it's probably much more in balance and in line with the way things used to be and should be. Uh, and, you know, so it's not necessarily one size fits all. It's this, this policy is really designed to kind of change the dynamic for the majority of journals and, and for the majority of publishing, but there'll be many instances where it won't work. And we've got a waiver built in for people who feel like either they don't have resources, um, they don't want to publish in open access, or they don't think that the policy works in their discipline. Um, and again, this is only a temporary fix. There needs to be a strategy that would support um, you know, everybody moving to this model, but also um, institutions if institutions are no longer taking their $40 million a year and putting it towards licensing and those resources, even half of that amount of money, put back into disciplines that don't have extramural funding uh, to support the publications by those disciplines, that might be a way to offset the costs. Can I have one? Sure. Um, UC Berkeley gives me no teaching relief for my work, mm -hmm. and my colleagues in England get no teaching relief. So our our experience is not that our universities are particularly supportive of our efforts. And so, you know, I've canvassed my colleagues in my, in my journal, and they're extremely pessimistic about whether, whether any university would really step in. We, our, our annual budget is $100,000, so it's not even like we would ask for that much. But even that much, we're pre pretty pessimistic about, about being able to recoup from a university. How many articles do you, does your journal publish a year? Yeah, I, 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 like I said, I mean, I, there's going, there are going to be situations, and and I don't necessarily know what the best answer is for that. Like I said, the policy is really designed to kind of take on these large entities that have been um, gaming the system to their own advantage, and and some of the smaller entities, you know, I think have to be, we have to come up with a strategy that's going to work to support them. I think they play an important role in all of our disciplines. We all have small societies and small society journals. Um, but the policy itself doesn't it, 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 it doesn't negate you know the ability of your journal to su survive with the same traditional model that you've been using. So the idea is that the library would continue subscribing to journals in the long term, let's say the next fifty years, as opposed to and then just renegotiate relationships with Elsevier and, and Wiley Blackwell. Is that the idea? Well, no. I mean, I wouldn't say fifty. I'm not going to predict out fifty years. But what I'm saying is that that the way that it currently stands, the libraries have limited resources, and the hope is that some of these resources could be freed up to make decisions about what they want to invest in, what journals they want to support. Right now, the way that they are supporting journals is simply based on usage and some other criteria, but usage and impact factor, you know, everyone needs to have certain journals at their campus, and if we can get those journals to move away from subscription models and libraries have more resources to support disciplines that are emerging or smaller societies that need support, then we can reallocate resources to places where they really should be going. 
and you know your university librarian would have more resources. I know Berkeley's done a great job of providing some seed money for f faculty who want to publish in open access journals. Um, Right? I mean, you have a program in place to do that, and faculty can apply, and it's need based. And, um, you know, there are mechanisms in place, but ideally, it would be great to get more money into those types of situations for folks who don't have extramural funds. One thing that I think is a little unfortunate about this debate is that these policies tend to be referred to as open access mandates. But they're not such a super strong mandate in that. This one, for example, has this automatically available waiver possibility. And also, as to anyone, it does not mandate what your publication outlet will be. It just puts in the background this license to you see to use your work. And if that use is inconsistent with the publishing model that you favor, then that's what the waiver is for. And I, I just want to add something to that, which is that, that it's in really, I mean, one of the, I mean, I'm a big supporter of faculty initiatives in, in this regard, but one of the things that, that comes up from thinking about journals like this is for me that, that we also really need to put a lot of pressure on the university to rethink its role and how it can encourage effective scholarly communication. I think, for, you know, one of the things that, that's astonished me in years, and I, I'll just say, just to introduce myself, I'm, a, I'm a Michael Eisen professor here, but I'm also one of the founders of the Public Library of Science, which is one of the big open access publishers and a nonprofit that's a publisher in biomedicine. But I've been really astonished at just how, I mean, really honestly chicken shitted the universities have been in their response to, to publishing in that, you know, they demand of their faculty that we publish, they evaluate us on the basis of, of publication, and yet their engagement with the publication process has been, has been you know, astonishingly wimpy. I mean, they don't, they don't really reward faculty for participating in the production of journals. You know, they, you know, they don't give fact teaching relief. They don't really give you much credit for doing that in any sense. And I, I would hope that one of the things that we do as, in addition to coming up with these policies, is really, you know, going after the institution as a whole and the university to try to encourage them to, to think about how they're spending their money to support publishing and, and not just in terms of giving money to authors to pay for journals, but in really rethinking the importance of individual scholarly societies and, 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 and individual scholars in, in, in producing scholarly output. And, and so it, it would be great if we could figure out a way to embed, embed that in the efforts that we're using around these. Open yeah, I think that's a great point. And I, I think a, a really good example of that would be e-scholarship, which is something that the university has been investing in as a platform for publications, there's something like 57 journals or so that are currently being published through e-scholarship. And um, you know, if you have a small society and, and it's very expensive for you to publish and you want to move to a digital platform, is your, is your scholarly journal published in print? Or yeah. if you wanted to move, if you wanted to join the rest of us in the 21st century, then um, we, okay, then um, you, you know, a platform like eScholarship has a really low unit cost per article, and they provide tremendous infrastructure and resources, um, and you're going to be handing out business cards in a little bit, just so. Um, it's a great way to do exactly what uh, Mike just said, is to start thinking about, you know, the whole picture, the whole landscape, and not just the scholarly article itself, but the whole process of publication, and that whole life cycle of the scholarly article, and what our place is in that life cycle as faculty. I've got about just like two or three more slides. I don't know how much time we have, but what I wanted to do, we can ask some questions, and I wanted to just show you how we've been implementing this at UCSF, what the workflow looks like for a faculty member, um, what kind of inconvenience you might have as you move, you know, and as you go day to day, and, and how this policy would affect you. So, okay, so why don't okay, why do you I'll just do that. We'll, uh, so what we've been doing, like I said, you know, we UCSF kind of set ourselves up to be the uh, guinea pigs for the experiment here. And uh, we've been working with uh, the CDL and uh, Catherine Mitchell and others uh, to develop a, um, an interface so that faculty could uh, implement and comply with this policy. Now what this is, this is at the um, Office of Scholarly Communication website, which is, doesn't really exist anymore, but it's part of the University of California Office of Scholarly Communication. This is a a drop-down menu, which you can imagine would be any campus. A faculty member would come to this and deposit an article. Um, if you wanted to, if you were asked by your publisher to um, apply an embargo period, you can do that here with your article. Uh, and um, if 
you wanted to notify your publisher that you see has this policy and that you wanted to addend the policy to your author agreement, you can do so by generating an addendum here. Uh, but if your publisher asks you for a waiver, uh, then you can select the waiver option here. And generally what happens is you submit an article to a journal and then you get an email from the journal. And this has been happening now for many journals and I'll show you the list of, uh, that I printed out this morning of the journals that we've been getting waiver requests from. And what the publishers are doing, they're saying, um, you know, congratulations on your publication and uh, you, one of your authors is at the following, one of the following institutions and it'll say Harvard, MIT and, and UCSF and then it'll say um, because of your, your institutional uh, policy, we need you to request a waiver in order to publish in our journal and they'll embed the link to this page right in it to make it as easy for faculty as possible because they know if they don't do that, they'll never get the waiver and they want that work, right? So it's kind of the last opportunity that we have to have leverage over them and we still hold the article that they want. So we, um, you click on the waiver button and then what happens is you get this waiver form where you put the article title in and then you populate it with uh, your name and the journal and the publisher. We collect some discipline specific information, your email. You upload either the publisher's final version if that's allowed or the author's final version which is the one that's gone through peer review before it's been typeset. You upload the file and you hit submit and then what happens is you get an email a confirmation. Um, I get this just because I don't have enough email coming into my inbox. Uh, I get a copy of all the waiver requests there have been like 95 or 96 of them so far. Um, and here's a waiver uh, by a colleague. Uh, it was published in uh, Journal of Nature. Um, it came in a couple days ago. Well, actually, this one's from last month. I got one that, on my other computer that I thought I was going to show you that is from uh, a couple days ago. But anyway, you get a link to the uploaded file, and we've got the waiver. And um, I would just want to switch computers because what I want to show you is what the waiver requests the kind of waivers that we've been getting. And um, is that okay if I switch right now? Which is yeah, while you switch, Rich, I have a question. So this would be going into a dark archive, right? Because right. it's attached to a waiver request? That's correct. So what, can you tell us a little more about what that means? What happens to works that are deposited when a waiver is? Um, Great question. Right now, all that happens is they Two probably of us have that question. they probably <laughs> just <laughs> they they probably well, just yeah. That's, where does that go? Somewhere dark. I it guess. goes somewhere dark. It's there's a uh, trash bin somewhere in Catherine Mitchell's office that <laughs> no, she prints them out and then throws them away. No, they um, I'm not exactly sure where they go right now. What we haven't really done is developed a, way, a, a seamless way to deposit them. But Justin, well, Justin, you want to explain what happens to the dark copies at this point? At this point, they should just be going into Merit, which is our uh, system-wide repository service, and they have no access available. Um, the keyed link probably allows the author to have access to that copy, but it's not publicly available. Which some of us who can't even manage our own files on our own computers would find handy uh, to have another kind of institutional stewardship is to just save our stuff for us, which is a partial answer to the question, why on earth would we deposit if we're not going to be granting permission to give open access because we've put in for a waiver? Well, this is one reason that it's handy to have an institutional keeper of our files. Um, and I mean, you may have heard, and Tom can tell us the details of our participation in the Hathi Trust, where uh, the library is a steward of digitized versions of lots of other people's books that are in our collection. It would be nice if we also could be a steward of our own work, even if it's not available for open access. It would be nice for it to be available for safekeeping, for preservation, for um, archival access sometime in the future when people are interested in the collected works of us and the copyright has expired and it would be neat for our institution uh, to have access to that. So this is a, the deposit stuff is something on which I think reasonable minds uh, could differ but that's. Uh, I just would also add, I mean it also allows for opportunities in the future should negotiations such as the ones that Rich have mentioned uh, progressed and, the, and, it, and then all of a sudden we can make the article available. Uh, of course, then we can send an email to the author and say, hey, you know, the, we've had some success with contractual negotiations. We believe we can make this available now. Would you, you know, could, could we have your permission to do so? So there's lots of opportunities. Um, those are 
are two reasons why you should do that. What are the other reasons? Um, the reason why I ask that question is, uh, is the following. What, what, guar what guarantees do we have that these dark caves, whatever they're called, are dark? Uh, it's, it's not a concern of mine, but it is a concern of many of my colleagues who have what are called uh, articles that have embedded copyright material, which can be extremely uh, expensive and difficult situations. If that material ever gets out, if your cave has even just a little ray of light shining in it, these people could potentially be in very, very difficult situations, which would cost them a lot of money and a lot of aggra aggravation. The question is, number one, how dark is the cave and how do we know that nothing will ever get out because Pandora's box was supposed to work the same way. But secondly, in the unlikely, hopefully, event that something does get out, what is the university going to do to protect the person who violated somebody else's copyright? Molly, you take that one, right? No, I mean, I, I'll just say, I mean, the, one of the benefits, I, I would argue, for the policy is that it's an institution-wide policy, that it's no longer a relationship, an individual relationship, and that we are all acting in good faith. We are submitting with a policy that is supposed to be you know, dark. The copy is supposed to be dark after the waiver, and we're acting in good faith. And if the publishers want to come after an individual, um, I think, I would hope the university would protect them on their behalf because of the policy that is in place. Not, you know, I, I think you have much more exposure now as an individual faculty member than you do before this policy. And you talk to people about their, their own behaviors of putting PDFs of their publications on their website. And you tell them you're not allowed to do that. And they say, what do you mean I'm not allowed to do that? And they have more exposure doing that. And this policy really helps allow that kind of behavior to happen. The other thing I will say is that in the context of, so this Hathi Trust activity that I referred to has been the subject of a copyright infringement lawsuit by the publishers, and one of their arguments was a concern that the dark archive just used for data mining and searching and so forth uh, would, n would become undark. And for what it's worth, the court was not convinced that those were serious enough concerns to undermine uh, the ability of the institution to do that dark archiving for a variety of what the court thought were clearly socially beneficial purposes. Well, that was a copyright battle in no, court. I mean of an individual. They would either be there as an individual and or they would be supported by the university. And it would be nice to know that... Well, I'm not sure I actually see about. the theory by which, under the circumstances that we've described, a rights holder would go after an individual faculty member who had submitted a waiver, so had not given the university permission to grant open access to their work, had merely put in an institutional repository a single copy, which I think from the perspective of the faculty member, that would be a great fair use case. I made a single copy on an institutional server for safekeeping so that if my computer broke down, I would have this backup copy at my home educational institution. I would take that case. I'm actually not a member of any bar, so I shouldn't say that, but, um, but I think that's a, great, that's a great case. And a better case than if you are individually hosting something and making it public, which lots of us do, which is also arguably we could argue for fair use, but, but that isn't too frightening. Now, if the university does accidentally let all of everything leak out of its archive, then the university as a defendant, it, it would be an attractive defendant as it has been uh, in this other um, context. And Tom knows way more about that, for better or for worse. I would think that the maximum risk would be your own workstation or backup file at home, which could you know, be accessed by bad people and all sorts of, I almost said bad relatives, but anyway, bad people <laughs> by all sorts of ways. I wanted to um, underscore the preservation function here. I mean, we all know um, that there are publishers who, and uh, publishers of books, journals, and newspapers who have lacked copies of what they produced and only found them uh, because um, libraries and archives um, kept them sometimes in a dark archive. And of course, it's true for documentary and other filmmakers um, in the era, especially where you had a deposit in the Library of Congress. Often, that's the last remaining copy uh, of, of the work. So I just had a question about, um, can you, 
two questions. One is uh, you talked about potential pushback from publishers and what you're seeing about that. And the second thing is um, what about publishers who now they're, now they're extracting from libraries, but they could just switch the model and make the entry fee for open access higher and higher and higher and just foisting, right. foisting to, it on the individual right. and then we're trying to get more uh, from our grants to okay. cover that. Those are two great questions. Um, so in terms of pushback from publishers, uh, what we had heard from places like Harvard and MIT is that they were seeing about a five to six percent waiver request rate from publishers. Uh, and we're seeing almost exactly the same thing. These are all of the waivers that have been requested at UCSF uh, since the policy was implemented on uh, May 21st. Um, and, you know, there are many journals that you would expect, lots of the nature journals, many of the specialty journals, PNAS um, is up there quite a bit. Um, and what, um, when you do the math on this, we got, so we have 94 waiver requests. Uh, when you do the math on that, it comes out to be about 5%. We, we um, like I said, publish about 4,500 articles a year at UCSF. So um, that means a 90... Like yeah. Nature, yeah. Pretty much. I, I should tell you, you know, I, it's very intimidating sitting on the receiving end of these emails at UCSF when I'm watching all my colleagues constantly publish in these journals. <laughs> uh, but the, um, yeah, so the, um, that means that 95% of the publishers are compliant and they are okay with the policy, and that's a really good sign. Um, it means that we can go and get all those articles from all the folks that are publishing and put them in our institutional yeah. repository or that they haven't noticed, but we've sent, we've sent formal uh, notifications to well over 100 publishers. We, we have a list of like 200 and something publishers that we are notifying of, and, and societies that are notifying of our policy, and presumably that is sufficient, uh, that, that formal notification process is sufficient uh, to allow us to continue to uh, sign the author agreements and but argue that we have a pre-existing license that we've notified you of. So that's point number one. Um, and then point number two, really this question about um, as publishers shift from the subscription-based model to open access, um, how, what's going to control costs? And so, you know, one of the interesting things that came out of our discussions with Nature, uh, we were really pushing them to move towards a um, author, institution, or funder-supported funder business model versus licensing. And they said, we can't do that. We can't afford it. Our unit cost is really high. You can actually go through public records and calculate their unit cost is somewhere around $30,000 per article. Okay. And so to recoup that, they couldn't charge $30,000. Um, and so, but then you ask them, you say, well, what if science decided to be open access? And what would you do? And they said, well, we would become open access the next day. Okay. So they're keenly aware. And so then you imagine a scenario, well, Nature starts at $5,000 to publish, which is what the cell journals decided they should be priced at, uh, which is absurd, by the way. Um, and then the, because um, if you, and then you, you um, say, well, what if science decides they're going to charge 4800 And then the next thing you know, you have these two prestige journals that are competing with each other for the same authors. Those guys are out there all the time trying to get the hot stories that they can sell their journals with. And so they want the authors, and they will be competing. You'll have market forces. You'll have competition for authors to submit to journals that we hope will keep the cost down. And also, there are many other alternatives to these prestige journals that are coming along that have different ways of supporting their enterprise that will lower the unit cost. And that's really what we want to do. We want to understand where the unit costs are. You know, Elsevier's unit costs, they say, are around $2,000, $2,500 distributed over all of their journals. E-scholarship's unit cost is somewhere around 12 bucks. Right, so I don't know what PLOS's unit cost is, but I'm assuming it's somewhere around. I mean, I, I, I'd be careful, but I, I'm not sure I totally buy your economics there. The, I mean, nature, sure. nature. The, the problem with the unit cost argument is that the real cost for nature of publishing your article is in rejecting everybody else's. That's article. right. And that the the it, you know we've done looked at their economics pretty closely, and I think a, you know science and nature probably do have a cost of about twenty thousand dollars per published article sure and there if they i mean I, I think it's ridiculous and i think it, their whole model is ridiculous but the but the you know the 
forcing them into an open access model would, would force them to change the way that they function, which would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it's not really compatible. You, you can't have a, you can't have a publisher that rejects 95% sure. of its submissions or 98% or whatever their number is, and then ask the published authors to bear the full cost of that. So they'd probably do something different. That's right. Their, their unit cost is salaries to editors primarily and who are right. mostly involved in rejecting they have most 500 in-house editors they travel all over the world they've got offices all over the place and you know we had hoped that they would be open to the idea of submission fees and if your article gets accepted you deduct the cost of the submission fee but it would really help generate a lot more revenue you lower through unit costs and and create you know i, I think what they're probably moving to is something plus and other publishers yeah. moving to is a, a world in which they don't they don't reject and then lose the articles that you 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 know that the you're paying to have your articles reviewed by the journal and then they stratify them, you know, some at the high tier, some at a lower tier, and that they don't, they don't, it doesn't force the burden of cost entirely on the, That's right. on the accepted authors. But it's, it's sort of a submission fee. Right. Rich, does this include embargo requests? Uh, no, these are just full waivers at this point. Do you have any data on how many embargo requests? Mm, no, I'm not sure we do. Can I ask you a very quick technical question about that? Is it automatic? I, I, is, do faculty governance rules mean that if I publish a paper at UCSF, whether I go to the website or not, right? So, so there's a, probably a large fraction of people who don't go to the website either to request a waiver or to deposit their work. Right. Does the license to UC apply irrespective of whether they deposit the article? So even if we don't, even if UC doesn't have a copy of the work, do they still have a right to to distribute the the work even even in the absence of having a physical copy of the does who have the right the does yes. UC have this yeah. non exclusive license yes. irrespective of whether the faculty does anything yes. active to promote yes yes okay. that's the benefit from my point of view that's the benefit of the policy for those faculty who want to do nothing and I'm not advocating this but for those faculty who want to do nothing they don't have to do anything if the publisher never contacts them and says give us a waiver um, and accepts your author agreement that you sign and give to them and you don't do anything then the policy can live in the background. We hope that people will comply. We hope that people will see that it's in their best interests to have their content come up in Google Scholar and other places that, you know, when the, when the, when the repository is robust and everyone sees the value of a large UC e-scholarship repository with something like 50,000 articles a year, which is our productivity as an institution, in that repository, that's going to be a tremendous um, opportunity for UC. So I think it'll start to sell itself at a certain point. Yes. You know, when you were showing, you were showing the list of uh, requests for waivers or sure. the waiver, and we see that they're, you know, nature and science, does that mean that this whole system is not working because simply anybody who wants to publish in those journals gets the waiver and, like, just doesn't do anything? I, I'm not sure how to interpret what yeah, I no, see I there. Yeah, I think that's an important question. It, it, obviously, for these upper-tier journals, they're in a position where they think they can force this issue. Um, and now what we're doing is engaging each of them in, in conversations about why they need the waiver. Nature prides itself on giving back a whole set of rights to authors. Um, and they feel like they're at the forefront of scholarly communications in their policies. And in many ways they are. Uh, so then we would love for them to take the next step and be willing to accept. Well, what's in it? Why, why should they have to? It seems to me that they have everybody over a barrel because okay. they're so important. Sure. So we have to just take ourselves out of UC and realize that we're part of a larger movement. And, you know, we're at 140-something institutions, but I'm going to give a talk in, uh, next week up in Calgary. I just gave another talk. So as more institutions buy into this process, um, I think the conversation, the publishers are just going to start to realize that um, faculty will make decisions. It's, all, it's also about, uh, it's, you know, it's a public awareness process. Faculty start to make a decision, you know, do you feel good about publishing in Nature versus, you know, that little poke that you get when you gotta f sign the waiver? I don't know, I mean, I think faculty start to make decisions and when you look at other journals, like the PLOS journals or um, others that are coming along, um, you know, like eLife and PeerJ and others that are trying to position themselves as alternatives to some of these and don't ask for waivers and the benefits might become immediately apparent to faculty, we'll all start making decisions about where we publish. I mean, these are early days for this kind of thing and I think the people on this list, the publishers on the list are exactly the ones that we expected except I think in the case of PNAS it was totally unexpected, but. Great. Hi, I'm uh, Jason Schultz, I'm the Africana Librarian at Doe Moffitt Library. I'm kind of going to the question of the smaller journals and I do have a lot of international and small journals that I do subscribe to. Um, my question though is, 
looking at the uh, sustainability of the open access model for uh, not just on the institutions, but small, smaller journals. We came across this, and Margaret and I worked across this as a, an African studies, uh, women's studies journal that is part of a package of journals from a US institution that was, it started open access over 10 years ago, was like a really big deal. But because of austerity, because it cuts, they've had to go to a, a subscription-based model. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot in the grand scheme of things, but for what is offered, it's actually was too much. We, we haven't, at least at Berkeley, and frankly, many of my other colleagues throughout the US have not subscribed to it. So, you know, just a telltale that the, you know, what I'm trying to ask is the sure. sustainability and the, the auspices of austerity in the UC system and elsewhere. Um, you know, do you have a worry about that, or what? What do we think about? Yeah, I mean, I think these that. are similar issues that we've discussed. One of the, one of the, um, possibilities is that societies, small societies, and publishing entities can start thinking about. You know, you set a forty dollars membership fee to be a part of your society, um, but if you charge a little bit more and allowed anybody who paid the membership fee to publish for free in your society journal, uh, you know, you could add more revenue and maybe offset some of the costs that way. I mean, there's lots of different ways that we can think about how the society journals support our scholarly activities and how we want to support the, the scholarly societies. I think you know, there's going to be lots of different experiments out there in terms of how individual societies manage these problems. Um, and you know, I don't think there's an easy answer, but um, you know, I, I, I don't know how you would respond to the argument that $40 might be too low if part of the function of the society is to support publication of the scholarship and you know so I don't know I know the goal is to get as many members as part of the society and you have graduate students and postdocs or whomever as part of the society and so you keep membership fees low and I've heard this from other societies but but thinking about the, what the role of those fees could be in supporting publications is another way to move forward as well yeah. um, have you heard any anecdotes about um, someone receiving a request for a waiver and saying no um, no, I mean, I think from our point of view, the um, faculty at this point, for the most part, don't, some of them don't even realize why they're being asked for a waiver, to be honest with you. Um, you know, they're getting this in the middle of all the other stuff that they're managing. And, um, but other faculty, yeah, I, mean, I think they're annoyed by the fact they, I've had several people ask me why PNAS is asking for a waiver. That's, they picked that journal thinking that it would be because of their liberal author policies. Um, yeah, I think faculty are starting to question it. Um, again, this policy is really new, and um, you know, we haven't done a lot of effort to talk about implementation and compliance because we've left that for the next year or two years as we start getting input, as I start going, getting feedback from people about what they need to, to implement this effectively. And I think at that point, we probably would expect more faculty to start questioning and, and offering resistance. So. subscriptions a year I mean that the it's 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 nuts and I, I think it's a it's a it, it's an example of a just crazy ecology that exists in this world where the university sort of gives us decreasing amount of money to the to the libraries for for subscriptions and essentially forces them into into a conflict with their own faculty and authors over getting access to to scholarship and and what really needs to happen is for the for the university to to rethink its it, how it's how it's supporting the publication effort of its of its of its faculty, and you know, right now it's doing it very very oh, poorly, and in, yeah. and in and in decreasing funds, and and you know, I don't know whether it's by revitalizing the university presses as a way of publishing publishing journals or or something, but but right. the idea that the idea that there's a conflict at all over a hundred dollar subscription to 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 journals that are that are publishing scholarly output of people across the university is is a sign of the True, true pathology in the in the way that publishing sure. works in academia. You know, and the publishers have done a great job of exploiting that tension and putting themselves yeah. right in the middle. And uh, so, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I would say to the university's credit, to all of our colleagues are, who, you know, in the libraries and and other places throughout the institution, you know, I think everyone recognizes that now, and I feel now the university and the faculty are much more aligned in a common goal. 
And I, you know, in, in all honesty, it's really the faculty coming up to speed to where the librarians have been for the last 10 yeah. years or so. I mean, the librarians have been out like, you know, they were writing so, about this 30 years ago and the right. universities have more or less ignored the, have ignored um, and, the I, and I think that the strongest face forward to the publishers will be the faculty and the universities sitting side by side and trying to get them to play, you know, play nicely in the sandbox. So we're touching on issues related to and also far beyond, I think, questions of open access policies. So in our last moments before thanking Rich, I want to encourage all of us to continue to be active in both the narrow and broad conversation. So on the narrow conversation, the system-wide academic senate has requested input from campuses on the proposed open access policy. And I know that our library committee uh, has been one of the um, recipients of the request from our campus to gather faculty input. I believe the um, Academic Freedom Committee is the other uh, place where discussions of this policy has been going on on our campus. Um, separate from the open access issue narrowly, I am a member of the Commission on the Future of the UC Berkeley Library, which uh, will be considering perhaps some of these. We haven't, uh, we've received our charge, but we haven't really set our agenda yet, but I imagine some of these questions of uh, the library's role in facilitating access to resources and also publishing uh, opportunities will be part of what uh, we'll discuss. So be on the lookout for opportunities to participate in that. We anticipate having a symposium, I think, in the November timeframe and, uh, and other opportunities as well for faculty, student, librarian, uh, input into those discussions. So uh, with your calendars marked, I'll I just give to, Rich the last word. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say one thing. I know um, I actually have a, a specific mission for coming here today, and that is I know that Berkeley is going to be reviewing this policy. And I, um, I want everybody, you know, obviously everyone has their own concerns, so you, you need to speak your mind about this. But think about the, the greater good in terms of the goals of this policy. This is a very flexible policy in many different ways, down to the fact that we can revise this policy anytime if it seems like it's not working for us. You can get out of the policy if it doesn't meet your disciplinary needs. Um, there are many ways that we can deal with specific disciplines in the implementation phase. If you don't like the license, you can change. We can have different boxes in the implementation phase to meet all the needs of the different constituencies. If your work contains previously licensed content, we could have a box that you check on the implementation side of things that excludes that work. There are lots of things that we can do. We can work together as a faculty on the implementation side. So please don't lose sight of the big picture here, which is really, it's not about us as faculty. It's really about having a conversation with the commercial publishers that basically says to them, you know, we're serious about these issues now, and we want to have a conversation with you where you take us seriously in a way that you never did before. So, you know, with that, of course, you know, you need to vote your conscience when you, when you guys have time to um, comment on this policy, but also please just think about the larger goals for this whole policy. And I would, I would say, you know, try not to get lost in the details so much as the big, big picture. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing scheduled in UC Berkeley Academic Senate to discuss this? Um, our library committee members might know yeah, you're, but you have, you, you basically, have you been asked, have you been asked to review the document and then there's a review period and then it goes back and then it's going to counsel and there's going to be a whole process. So, um, I mean, the alternative is that if it doesn't make it through system wide, then individual campuses have the ability to pass it. And what you'll see is probably campuses like, I think UCLA would most likely be the next, and there's several others that are very strongly for it, like UCSF was, um, and you'll see a patchwork of individual campuses adopting a very similar policy, which is okay, it's better than nothing, but it's not as great as it could be if the entire system was able to move this thing forward. Rich mentioned, and I think he was one of the masterminds of the seed of this idea originally at UC, which then inspired lots of our peer institutions to take the ball and run with it, and um, and uh, I think now we have an opportunity to learn from their experiences and, of course, to learn uh, from experiences close to home uh, with UCSF's uh, early action here. So let's thank Rich for coming to share all of that. Thank you. Thanks.